We're no strangers to WoW clones, a term coined when studios began attempting to replicate the success that World of Warcraft had achieved back in the 2000s. Rift, Ion, Allods, there are numerous MMOs that have attempted to yet ultimately fail to capture the essence of WoW, its charm, its quality. And while that quality has very noticeably declined over the years, there's still a noticeably higher quality in terms of what they produce than their free-to-play competitors. Q Terrace Lands Reveal WoW was dropped in China earlier this year, and shortly after being dropped by their Chinese publisher, Terrace Land was announced. The announcement trailer set the MMO community ablaze with criticism of literally every aspect of the game. We saw Deathwing in the trailer, Stormwind, Night Elves, Blood Elves, monsters, abilities, names. There was absolutely no way this was a coincidence. Nevertheless, over time, anticipation for the game grew. More people began to show interest in it. This was partly due to Terrace Land actually looking pretty good, and partly because they advertised themselves as a non-pay-to-win MMO, which was comically short-lived, as they were called out for having pay-to-win in the current closed beta and played the fool. Whoops, I didn't know that was pay-to-win. Huh, I guess we are. Followed by the removal of every claim of having no pay-to-win from all forms of social media, including their website. I mean, that right there, that is a reassuring sign. I would have no qualms putting my faith in that studio, they seem to me at least like a paragon of unparalleled truth. Despite the drama surrounding their plagiaristic origins, despite the very evident lack of competence, I got to play the global close beta running at the time of this video, and admittedly, I was shocked at the kind of game it turned out to be. Before I discuss this in any detail, I do want to take a moment here to thank my incredible patrons over on Patreon to allow for me to do regular videos like this every week. You guys are phenomenal. Now back to the video. Before even beginning my journey in not Azeroth, I, along with many other players, encountered somewhat of a security issue. The anti-cheat refused to allow you access to the game unless you disabled your firewall and antivirus. Unfortunately, whitelisting the directory did not work, thus I was a little bit reluctant to do this, but at the same time, what's the worst that could happen? Tencent is a large, reputable company. There's no way there would be any risk to disabling all forms of protection, allowing them direct access to every layer of my computer. After giving Tencent my bank credentials, my PayPal login, my social security number, and lubing my rear end for an expected yet simultaneously unwelcome scavenger hunt, I was greeted by the character creator. Designing characters is part of the fun of playing an MMO. Thankfully, Terrace Land provides you with a lot of customization options, which we'll touch on in just a moment, as we have something a little more important to discuss. The classes, which are gender and race locked. If Terrace Land could do anything to differentiate itself from WoW, it's by alienating a large portion of players by restricting what they can play by locking classes behind genders. We have the human male warrior, the female blood, I mean the, the female elf mage, the female human priest, the female night elf, I mean the female elf with dark hair ranger, Legolas, Leomon, male blood elf Arthas, emo male undead shadow swordsman, female human phantom priest. There's a lot of variety present, which is further enhanced by their extensive character create. You have seven unique hairstyles, you have seven hair colors, six skin colors, six eyebrow types, seven eyebrow color options. You then have a few different eye types, eye colors, eye shadow types, eye shadow colors, blush types, blush colors, and 11 makeup options that include several markings on your face. Truly a remarkable selection of customization options that really allow for you to display your artistic vision and creative genius. The game begins with a vision of your future. Everyone's dying, you're doing a terrible job at being a hero. You engage not Deathwing in a brutal battle with a full party consisting of AI-controlled party members, which is a recurring theme in this game. Some of them die, another recurring theme in this game. This was a tutorial on how to not play an MMO and what your average dungeon and raid experience will no doubt be like. Shortly after witnessing everyone die, you wake up in a tranquil forest greeted by not Jaina. As you slowly ascend the mountain, you're not quite certain how you even got on. You're then greeted by a beautiful cinematic view of the world. This was beautifully done and is definitely the first time I have ever seen an introduction to the game world presented in this form.
Not Azeroth is a beautiful world. In the dozens of hours I've spent in the closed beta, I've seen gorgeous open grasslands during the day, stunning open grasslands during the night, exquisite open grasslands during foggy weather, and that was all in roughly only approximately 30 levels of gameplay. I can only begin to imagine the diverse selection of regions as I continue to progress through the game, which, judging by the map, is going to be densely populated by all types of grandiose grasslands with varying weather types. In my excitement, I quickly continued on, slowly being introduced to various different game mechanics and exploring the large open world that was now at my fingertips. It was at this point that I began to realize that the story wasn't perhaps the grandiose adventure that they thought it was. You're introduced to a cast of characters that have very little in terms of depth or personality. The not Torin guy, some blonde female humans, not a single character had any real impact on the game nor the narrative, which was very difficult to understand. It moved along so rapidly with what seemed like at least 75% of the content that should have been present, absent. What we were left with, after dozens of hours, was a disconnected world with a story that serves a singular purpose, to take you to the next area, which really isn't something that should surprise us as MMO players. It's about what we've come to expect, very few MMOs of decent narratives that serve a greater purpose beyond moving from hub A to hub B. World of Warcraft doesn't have the complex narrative that Final Fantasy XIV has, but the story is connected and even if convoluted at times, tells a story that you're semi-interested in not skipping, partly because you can't really skip the scripted scenes. The story after several days streaming Terrasland can be summarized as definitely complex. You appear in a vision of the future die to not Deathwing, wake up to not Jaina, get not Breath of the Wild introed, meet not Torin, learn not Torin's tribe of not Torin or at war with Centaur, Moon is alive, Moon dies, Oh no! Moon is alive again, Okay. Moon's dad betrays us, Moon's dad dies, Moon's dad asks us to save Moon, we leave, that's the last we ever see Moon, we meet Princess Catherine who the king calls his daughter, she calls him her brother, not her father, so it must get real weird at family gatherings. Not Tyrion Lannister helps Catherine. Not Tyrion Lannister betrays Catherine. Not Tyrion Lannister dies. We wander around fairly aimlessly for two days before Not Deathwing attacks the kingdom. We relive our vision of the future. We don't kill Not Deathwing, but instead, the cutscene abruptly ends and we're rebuilding with no understanding of how or why we're at where we're at in the story. Again, very complex. Not complex in so that there's a lot going on and you're finding it difficult to process the abundance of information. On the contrary, everything was very easy to understand. It's just that there was so little to understand that you were left waiting for the next bit of story, only to never have the next bit of story. The voice acting was absolutely stellar and really enthralled me in the story. Is this inscribed stone thingy sending us a message? Yeah. What Torrid? Don't you see the no go sign? He forgot everything except his name. I'm a woman! I was hired by him to help him retrieve his past and recover his memories. That is not my pronoun! I am a woman! He is well trained and surprisingly strong. I'm not a he! I've spent my life guarding the Onkash, fighting off more invasions and saving more lives than I can remember. I don't think I've ever spent as much time as I did in this game laughing at every character, every situation and story element unraveling, all of the voice acting. This is an experience I haven't had in a very long time, if ever. The narrative, however, is only one aspect that comprises a game. Content, both in the form of PvE and PvP, is another, as is the world you inhabit and the gameplay, which makes up the bulk of the game. So, let's talk content. Terrasland has marketed itself as the not WoW MMO that has conceptualized everything with no inspiration from WoW. This is very obvious as Terrasland looks absolutely nothing like WoW. Terrasland features dungeons which vary in difficulty levels. These dungeons have item level requirements and allow for AI participation. You can queue for the dungeon and have it filled with real players, or you can opt to have it filled with AI party members. For the majority of these dungeons, I couldn't really tell the difference, except for one elite dungeon I did, which was the only dungeon that filled with 100% real players. The healer didn't understand mechanics, which were very difficult to understand, I will admit. This was by far the most mechanically challenging boss fight we'd encountered up until this point. At certain intervals, the boss marks a player. When the selected player gets sealed in a destructible casing, you're to attack it and break them out before he unleashes an AoE in the direction of the player and kills them. The healer happened to fail this mechanic every time and subsequently blamed the DPS for being bad. Despite the mechanic requiring total attention, 
from all players not paralyzed by the mechanic. He proceeded to politely leave immediately after failing the encounter a single time. 15 minutes wasted in the dungeon was of no consequence to him when compared to the alternative coming to the realization that he needed to participate in the mechanic to actually overcome it. But I do understand that at times mechanics are very difficult to learn and I don't hold this against him at all. That, that's what the healer said. The healer is complaining our DPS is too low. The reason our DPS is too low is because the highest DPS repeatedly gets trapped and, and doesn't get freed in time. They said waste of time. <laughs> Good luck. Are you see are they going to leave? Dude, they're fucking rage quitting because they weren't paying attention. Holy fuck, what a toxic piece of shit. Oh my god, all that time wasted. Sure, let's waste 15 fucking minutes. Wow. Oh no! We wiped one time, fuck this, let's quit. Seriously, this is a fucking beta test. And that's the mentality they have. Oh no! We wiped one time. They weren't paying attention to the people getting trapped. They were standing there. If they had helped when players got trapped, the players might not have died. And if the players didn't die, <laughs> then we might have cleared it. PVE also involves daily quests, missions, and raids. Daily quests and missions are fairly self-explanatory. They're the content that none of us want to do, but are all forced into anyway. Like when your girlfriend wants you to come hang out with her college friends, but you're an introvert and you hate people that aren't video game waifus. I have not participated in any raids yet, but from what I've seen, they are larger and more difficult versions of dungeons. I'm curious if you can run raids with AI companions, and if so, whether they'll die as often as they do in dungeons. The AI dungeons I did felt like I was being shown repeatedly in access what not to do in a boss environment. Eventually, I unlocked PvP. I queued for a battleground, which is one of numerous PvP activities and was sorted into one of two teams, blue or red. Unfortunately, this was nothing like the Halo skit of the same name. On it! Come on! Toss that grenade! That was the worst throw ever. Of all time. Not my fault. Someone put a wall in my way. Red team and blue team all ran to the very center of the map and just tunnel visioned the tanks. Tanks would immediately assault each other's backlines and we spent 10 minutes with very little in terms of progress from either side because the healers never died, which meant that the tanks never died. And then the timer ran out and my team won. Looking at the map, it seems as though you capture various points and accumulate resources for each point held. But from the games I played, I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this if you've ever played World of Warcraft and maps like Alteric Valley. We all just zerg mid and said, fuck mechanics. I did not get to engage in the smaller scale PVP mode, unfortunately. Terrace Land is a tab target game. It is not action combat. It is not a hybrid action combat. It is tab targeted. You click a target and you cycle through additional targets with the tab key, or alternatively, you click a skill and it automatically locks onto a target. Abilities genuinely looked pretty good, very high quality. You did have a very limited hop bar, which I've never been fond of. I've always enjoyed the chaos of having 13 hop bars in WoW and Final Fantasy XIV, with five bars for abilities, buffs, defensives, several for mounts because you need a different mount for different occasions, and the rest for potions or stat boosting food items. Your class, while gender and race lock, does possess two skill trees, adding an additional layer of depth. My class had access to both a DPS and a healer tree, as I personally find healer very easy to play. I mean, all you really do is you hit your heal button and everyone just stays alive. Like, like really, how challenging is that? All you need to do is stand back, use your little magic healing spells and your little potions while we do all the work. I opted for the DPS tree. DPS is the most important role in any game. DPS stands for damage per second. Without DPS, you'll have no damage. Tanks just stand there, AFK, healers, spam, one, two, three, heal. It's up to me to carry my team to victory. Each tree has several rows of talents that you can spec into, which have passive increases to damage, reductions to cooldowns, or directly alter an ability in its entirety. And since you're largely limited in how many abilities you can have on your hotbar, 
it is imperative you know exactly what the meta is going to be so you can follow it. You don't want to have to build something unique. You want other people to build something that can maximize your damage output so you're hitting for higher numbers than the other guy next to you and can slash flex at him after referring him to the DPS counter at the top right. While the class system is truly groundbreaking, I will admit that where the game actually shines is with class gear. When leveling, you obtain new gear. New gear in Tarasland doesn't have a different appearance. On the contrary, all gear looks the same, all shares the same model, which means that you'll never have individual pieces that don't match. If that is not a massive W right there, I don't know what is. You can, however, purchase cosmetic items from the cash shop that do directly alter your appearance. It only costs $25, $35, somewhere around there. Speaking of the cash shop, yes, one exists. And whether it's pay to win or not is entirely dependent on how you define pay to win. Does it allow you to purchase in-game currency with real money? Yeah. Can you purchase gear or dungeon and raid runs with said currency? Yeah. Does paying provide you an unfair advantage over someone that doesn't spend money? Yeah. But I'm not going to tell you whether something is pay to win or not. I've had this debate numerous times and there's just no winning. It doesn't matter how I define the term, people will always contest my definition. Thus, I can really only tell you what advantages you will or will not have and let you be the deciding party. Tarasland ultimately ended up being a very surprising MMO. On the surface, it is a very high quality cross-platform game. The character models are good, the world looks great, and a lot of inspiration was very obviously taken from World of Warcraft. But when you peel back the layers, you slowly realize that it feels much more like a mobile game than it does a PC one. I actually described this during stream as being more of a mobile MMO when compared to PC MMOs and much more of a PC MMO when compared to mobile MMOs. It's a step above the typical mobile trash that pollutes the genre, but a step below the better quality PC titles. I had a lot of fun playing the game, but at the same time, I don't really think this is going to necessarily appeal to MMO players that want a full PC experience, not one that's watered down by mobile mechanics and limitations. Now, if you're not interested in Terrace Land, absolutely no problem. I have you covered with two different videos on screen right now that might be of more interest to you. 